last song spoke of the hope that the faithful children of God have in Christ. All that we strive to do in the study of the scriptures in bringing our lives in subjection to the teachings of Christ in the proclamation of the gospel and in the defense of it ultimately and finally has its hope in heaven for each one of us. So this morning I would like to talk with you for a little while about the reason, the reason for our hope. You remember that Peter wrote to Christians in a familiar passage, 1 Peter 3, chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer, meaning a defense, to everyone who asks you a reason, a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Thus, we who name Christ is our Savior. We who are gathered here this day for the reasons the New Testament says Christians are to gather together, sing songs as we did and pray to our Heavenly Father and pray for one another as we do so. We are mindful that we should be ready to explain and to defend the foundation of our hope. For Paul says in Romans 8, 24, we are saved. I hope. Again, I think it necessary to remind ourselves it's not that we are wishing for heaven. Hope doesn't mean that. Saved by hope means we're saved by the right that we as faithful Christians have to expect heaven as our reward. But it's even more than that. It's coupled, that expectation is, with a strong desire to receive the inheritance. In that way, we look beyond life and all of its ups and downs and pains and even direct persecutions because we are faithful Christians. We look beyond all of that and we see a homeless soul beyond the sunset. We have a lot of songs that carry with it that notion, and they're good songs. They make us mindful of what most of the world doesn't have on his mind at all and that is eternity and spiritual things and especially as we live on the spiritual level bringing the the appetites of the flesh into subjection to the will of Christ that is living spiritually so we ask what the reasons are for the Christian's hope to be in Christ for all of us must be ready according to Peter to provide reasons to others for placing our hope in Christ. The communists used to make light, and still do, of Christians by saying, well, your hope is in the sky by and by. Because the communist idea is, what can you do now? And they put us to shame sometimes because they don't expect anything after death, but they'll work so hard so that the next generation can have a better way to go. And so on as their hope resides in the here and now in their false philosophy. But we want to give reasons. And God has never said, follow me, without reasons to follow him. Although there are many reasons for me personally to place my hope in Christ, what I have to say in this given sermon sets out some fundamental facts that constitute at least one reason for my hope in Jesus Christ. In delivering then this sermon, I hope thereby to give adequate reasons for others to have faith as it's set out in the scriptures in Jesus Christ, to obey his will, to become Christians, and to live the rest of their lives, however long or short that is, adhering steadfastly to his will for us on earth, and thus form and keep the hope of eternal life in heaven. 
Furthermore, I trust that this study will strengthen and confirm those of us who are Christians, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, to make them stronger, to not lose out, as it were, by focusing on the affairs of this present world because these things are passing away. They're all going to be gone. Anything you can experience through your five senses is going to disappear. And like I've said many times, using the example of the late Marshall Keeble having preached a gospel meeting in West Texas and the brother owned a great amount of land, took him up in the airplane to show him all of his spread. When he got through, he asked Brother Keeble, what do you think of this? Brother Keeble said, you're going to burn it, God's going to burn it all up. That keeps you in perspective. It ought to. We ought to think about that all the time. Whatever you possess and can touch and taste or look at in this life will be someday melt with fervent heat. Thus I want to have my hope in that which is not material, which is not bound by time and space. We begin then our study by mentioning certain facts that no one can successfully, let me emphasize that, successfully deny. And that includes atheists and any other infidel. Now, what I'm about to go into, many of you have heard before, but don't let them, because they are not new to you, mean that uh, they don't have any impact, because they do. So let's look at some facts that cannot be successfully denied. First of all, Jesus lived as a human being on this earth. There was a time when there were those who, skeptics, who tried to say that he didn't live. But if you study today up to the most recent, popular skeptics, atheists, etc., they've quit doing that. Only the most ignorant and highly prejudiced skeptics will question the historicity of Jesus. And the historicity, I mean that he existed in past time and space, just like we exist now in time and space. So why is this the case? Because there is an overflowing abundance of adequate evidence from unbiased sources that he was a real human person, a real human being who lived on this earth. Now, when you come to grips with that and you're a thinking person, what are you going to do about that the more you learn about it? How do we know this? Well, I can't cover everything in this time, but here's where some of you are going to recognize some of these proofs. Look at the Roman historians, first of all. They attest to the fact of Jesus having lived as human being on this earth. Tacitus, in his annals, and he was around 112 A.D., wrote of him. He didn't attempt to say he didn't exist. Pliny the Younger, who lived at the same time, about 112 A.D., in writing a letter to Emperor Trajan, now, these folks didn't believe he was divine, but they didn't try to say he didn't exist. They dealt with him as one who really did exist or had existed. Then Suetonius, in 120, not many years after these guys, he was a uh, court official under Emperor Hadrian. He wrote about him mentioned him as a real person. And we leave those Roman historians and we look at some Jewish sources. And of course, they too denied the deity of Christ. But they also attest to his historicity. I mentioned in class this morning Flavius Josephus, who was born around 37 AD. He was a Jewish general and turncoat as far as the Jews were concerned. But he was a historian, and he writes and mentions about Jesus as a person. He doesn't try and say, oh, this is a figment of somebody's imagination. He never did really exist. The Talmud is a book of Jewish law, and believe it or not, it often speaks of Jesus. Well, again, it's not trying to say, oh, he's the Messiah, the Son of God, believe him. But it's not, they don't approach it from that standpoint. They approach it that, yes, he was here, he did this, not that he didn't exist. So they don't deny that Jesus lived. 
but they do reject his deity. Then there is a Samaritan historian by the name of Phallus, who was around 52 AD, and he attempted to explain away the darkness that took place at the crucifixion. But it's important to note, he did not deny that Jesus existed. So overwhelming is the evidence. As I said just a moment ago, even those who say God does not exist, they try to oppose God. They will say Jesus Christ of Nazareth existed. That doesn't mean they say he's deity and you ought to believe him and he's son of God. It means they do not approach opposing him on the basis of that he did not exist. H.G. Wells, you may be familiar with him, wrote an outline of history. He was an atheist. And he's been dead a long time. But he said, one is obliged to say, here was a man. This part of the tale could not have been invented. Unquote. In other words, that he existed, that he was a human being. Can't invent that. And yet, he didn't believe in him. So when people try to say, oh, Christ didn't even exist, use these proofs and say, well, what are you going to do about this? And you'll see more how that comes out. Some of you may have uh, uh, Will Durant's collection, lengthy thing on the story of civilization. But he wrote, Two chapters on Jesus. Now, he didn't believe he was the Son of God, but he believed he really existed as a human being on this earth. You can't just dismiss those things, especially when it comes to scholars of our day, because scholar means they have researched it. Now, some people think a scholar is somebody that speaks in such a way you don't understand him, so you can go away and say, isn't he scholarly? A scholar is somebody who researches and studies and has proof for drawing conclusions that he does. Now, let's look at the evidence for the New Testament. Hold these things concerning Jesus actually lived in past time and space as a human being like we live on earth. But I want us to look at some evidence for the New Testament as a historical document. Now, you remember some time ago, I preach a sermon from time to time examining the resurrection of Christ just as a historian would. And you approach it the same way. But this time we're just talking about the New Testament. Its writers claim to record their works as historians or even witnesses to the actual or real events. Luke, you remember, was a trained person. He was a physician. And his gospel account, as well as his history, which is the book of Acts, compose over a third of the New Testament. Here's what he said in Acts 1, 1 through 3, the way he began his history, if you recall it that. And, of course, it's a continuation of what he wrote in Luke about the life of Christ. The former treatise, that would be the book of Luke, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And that's a real person, a real person acting in this world. And he writes like you're writing about George Washington or somebody. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he threw the Holy Ghost to given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's the way he begins. Now, he doesn't write the way they teach you in the MLA style sheet to write a scholarly document. They didn't write that way in those days. But he has all the elements there. He's showing you that this is a studied out thing and that he's basing everything he's writing in fact. If you look at Luke 2, 1 through 4, you'll see him begin the Gospel of Luke the same way. Now, the Apostle John 2, in his Gospel account, wrote as an eyewitness to many of the event, events that he recorded. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, 
But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that in believing you might have life through his name. Then he talks about all the books. If the everything he did had been written down, the world wouldn't hold them. In John's first epistle, you remember, 1 John 1, 1 through 4, he very plainly declares, I have seen, touched, heard Jesus Christ. Every apostle could do that kind of thing. Paul, we'll just call him a Jewish rabbi, for if you don't consider anything about his apostleship and Christian, that's what he would have been, a Jewish rabbi, produced half of the books of the New Testament. They are his personal letters. Now, if you're a historian doing research, that's a treasure trove. Because they train you to get back as close as you can to, let's say, whoever it is you're writing about or the events you're writing about. And in history, such things are called primary sources. I have in my library, picked it up 50 years ago. And I dare say most people, if not all of you, I like Ken and I, <laughs> uh, don't even know who this is, but these are volumes called The Intimate Papers of Colonel House. Now, if you had lived before World War I and right after World War I, you would have known exactly who that was because he was the one of the very close confidants and advisors to President Woodrow Wilson. Well, I got these things because I was writing a paper back ages ago, and I got them because they are the published writings of this man. And when you go to write about something, you want to get what you can directly as you can from that person. And that's what you're having said here about the writing of the New Testament. And again, you've got Paul's letters. You know, people go to all these presidential libraries to get into the specific letters that were written. So you've got this here for everybody to look at. Everybody to challenge. And you've got the challenge of 1 Thessalonians 5.21, but Paul himself proved all things. Hold fast. That was just good. And he claimed to have been an eyewitness along with others of Christ. Remember him reasoning with the Corinthians on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 1 through 8, especially 3 through 8. He talks about all these people that had seen the risen Christ. As a historical document, the evidence for its reliability is like the old fellow said, it's just unget overable. It was written soon after the events that it records took place. A fellow by the name in these, some of these fellows I'm using have been dead a long time, but what I'm trying to get you to see by using them and not some of the modern ones of today who concluded the same thing is that this has not just happened. This has been available to people for a long time if they wanted to find it. A fellow by the name of Nelson Glick, who is the former president of the Jewish Theological Seminary of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, also a renowned Jewish archaeologist, said this, I quote, in my opinion, Every book of the New Testament was written between the 40s and 80s of the first century A.D. Now, he says that's my opinion. Does he base it strictly upon thin air? He couldn't and be the person that, do, that, that he is and what he does. Then we read a fellow by the name of W.F. Albright, who was a biblical archaeologist. His material is all around. Again, he is the late W.F. Albright. He said this. We can already say emphatically that there's no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after AD 80. Notice he says, we can say emphatically, no solid basis for dating any book. Well, how can you say that? If somebody calls you in question, you're going to have the proof of it. Yes, men like this did, and they do. The New Testament is noted for the historical accuracy in areas that can be tested. And it's been done over and over again. Again, this uh, 
Nelson Gleck said, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. And that doesn't just cover the New Testament, that covers Old Testament as well. Then we find this from Sir William Ramsey. And his writings are excellent to read. Luke, and I'm quoting, is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. He is possessed of the true historic sense. In short, this author should be placed along with the greatest historians. Now, when you take that and then the manuscript attestation for the New Testament, it, becomes, it just builds evidence on top of that evidence to accept it for what it is. So our hope can remain strong, the hope that is set out in this New Testament for those who love the Lord and keep his commandments. In the number of copies, this is for the purpose of comparison, with other ancient manuscripts of secular works, there are over 4,000 Greek manuscripts, 13,000 copies of portions of the New Testament. There is an ongoing work to this present hour by different ones trying to get to all these little fragments and things because a lot of them, there's so many of them, have never been set down and just studied through. They're still there to be studied. Now contrast that number, 4,000 Greek manuscripts, 13,000 copies of portion of the New Testament with the historical documents of Caesar's Gallic Wars. There's only 10 Greek manuscripts for that. The Annals of Tacitus, only two. Livy, 20. For Plato, seven. For Sophocles, 100. Now, in the time between the originals and the earliest copies that are come down to us, there's a big difference. Fragments exist that are within 50 to 100 years concerning the New Testament. Complete copies that are within 300 to 400 years after the originals were written. Now, keep that in mind. Compare that with manuscripts of other classical histories that no one challenges, no one questions to be real. The histories of Thucydides, the earliest copy we have is 1,300 years removed from the original. And then one of the foremost Greek historians that is quoted from constantly Histories of Herodotus. And the earliest copy is 1,350 years removed from the original. I mentioned earlier Caesar's Gallic Wars. 950 years from the original to the first copy. Another famous Roman historian I mentioned earlier, Livy in his Roman history, 350 years. And by the way, uh, what we have that is the earliest copy is only a fragment. Then you have the histories of Tacitus, 750 years from the time it was written to the earliest copy. And you have the annals of Tacitus, 950 years. And there are only two manuscripts of that. One time in Roman history class years ago, they let us take a period to lecture on a book that we chose that pertained to Roman history. And I chose Michael Grant's The Historical Jesus because he's the foremost, he's dead now, foremost uh, historian. He was alive when I did this, British historian. Some of the best writing I've ever read. Uh, but he doesn't believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So I took his book and did things like this and went through it 
He just brought all this out. And of course, during the course, this was toward the end of it, the teacher had constantly referred to various books like this as if, you know, there's no doubt, nobody's going to question that they're real and genuine. And so I pointed all this out about the New Testament text. He never said anything. Gave me a good grade on it, but he never said anything one way or the other. And I'll tell you one thing that tells you what kind of fellow he was. He had black rimmed glasses with little Playboy bunnies right here on each side, so that'll say a whole lot. <laughs> he, he wasn't interested much in uh, anything but what he wanted to teach in Roman history. The variances that exist between the ancient copies are really few. Only one half of 1% is in question compared to 5% for the Iliad. Even then, here's what can be stated. Sir Fred Frederick Kenyon, I have a book by him on this very matter, who's an authority in the field of New Testament textual criticism, said this, and I'm quoting, No fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith rests on a disputed reading. It cannot be too strongly asserted that in substance the text of the Bible is certain. Especially is this the case with the New Testament. Such evidence for the New Testament has led to this following statement by the late F.F. F. Bruce. He's been dead a few years. Had a number of his books and they were quite good in this area and others. I quote him, and he said, The evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors. The authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their, their authenticity would generally be beyond all doubt. Now, if not true, that is the New Testament. Then what must we conclude? We can only conclude that it is a carefully contrived and crafted lie. The New Testament writers leave us no alternative. They are either witnesses, and what a witness actually is, or they are false witnesses. Paul reasons that way in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 and 15. Either the events occurred as described, or as Peter said, they are cunningly devised fables, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. And he used that as he was saying they are not. We are witnesses to Christ, and he specifically refers to the Mount of Transfiguration. And we can't say they might have been sincerely deceived, especially in reference to the resurrection of Christ. You remember in Acts 10, verses 39 through 41, that they declared they had eaten and they had uh, drank with him afterwards. They affirmed that they saw and touched him, as I referred to earlier. John did that in 1 John 1, verses 1 through 4. They leave us no room saying they were mistaken or deceived. Now, there are some skeptics have, that have tried to offer the, the following as an alternative. Perhaps their, the disciples, that is, their grief was so terrible and the loss because of the crucifixion of Jesus was so terribly upon them that they actually all hallucinated or they had grief inspired visions of Jesus the problem with that is that hallucinations and visions are highly individualistic experiences one person might see the hallucination or vision but several or many people don't see the same vision at the same time it just doesn't stand to reason. As outlined in the gospel accounts and also by the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8, we've referred to that several times already, the resurrection appearances of Jesus 
were often witnessed by many at the same time. Remember, Paul mentions that over 500 saw him at one time on one occasion. So we have no choice but to conclude that either the New Testament is a book of truth because it's based upon facts or it's a book of lies. Now, that's what the skeptic has to do. He has to say, now this New Testament you're holding is nothing but a contrived book of lies and I'm going to prove it. Well, it would be interesting to see them do it. They can't. It would be interesting to see them attempt to do it. At this point, we can fairly say, I think, that no one can successfully deny the following three facts. One, Jesus lived as a human being on earth. Two, the adequate evidence for the authenticity of the New Testament as a historical document is overwhelming. And I've only touched on some of that because of time. And three, if it's not true, the New Testament is nothing but a contrived lie. Now, given that these facts cannot be successfully discredited, that is, shown not to be facts, then I want you to consider with me the implication of them. We are forced to make a decision concerning Jesus. You can't deny that he lived. The evidence is saying he did. Therefore, we must decide who he is. Is he what his followers claimed him to be? The only begotten Son of God, Matthew 16, 13 through 17, for that's what Peter confessed him to be. Or is the New Testament's representation of him false? So that means you've got to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at least and say, they didn't prove anything about Jesus being the Son of God. Everything in there is not true. It's not factual. Concerning the evidence of the New Testament as a historical document, we cannot deny the overwhelming evidence, and I may say credible evidence, for the New Testament. Therefore, we must decide concerning its historical reliability. And this question then comes up. Will we accept it on the same basis that we accept other historical documents of the same time period? If so, then we will either accept it at face value or reject it along with all other historical documents of that time. And yet the evidence for them is much less than for the works of the New Testament. Concerning whether the New Testament is true, we cannot say that it was simply a sincere but mistaken effort to explain who Jesus was. Thus, we must decide whether it's true or a carefully contrived lie. It is this last issue upon which all else truly depends. And when a person wants to try to say, well, Jesus is not who he claimed to be, then the ball's in their side of the court. Let them show where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John told a lie. That the whole New Testament is nothing but lies. The implications of our decision should be looked at. If we decide that the New Testament is a carefully contrived lie, here's what we get into. We must concede that a book with the world's highest standard of morality was composed by a group of liars, frauds, and deceivers. The book certainly doesn't teach that such as that is right. This is the case because no book contains a higher standard of love and morality than does the New Testament. Just think of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, or Paul's discourse on love in 1 Corinthians 13. Well, there's nothing else in literature that compares to those things. Not anything. And yet look what they're talking about. They're extolling the right attitude. They're extolling honesty. They're extolling fairness. And yet, the people who wrote all that really were writing right the opposite to convince people of something that's false. It doesn't make sense. 
So we'd be for, forced to concede that a book with overwhelming evidence as a historical document was then put together carefully to deceive us. And yet Paul himself invites us, as I said earlier, prove all things. That's even what he wrote. Hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21. Tell me a crook in any way whatsoever that wants you to research carefully everything he's done. No, they always practice the big cover-up. They don't want you seeing too much what they've done, if anything. They would have to deal with historical names, places, and events. They would have to use them, but yet entwine them in lies, bold-faced lies. And all you have to do is go to a court case and watch how things work. And when somebody is lying, you can pretty well tell when he gets into details, it'll all wrap up, and they'll say, well, did you say back over here this when I asked you this question? But now over here you said this. And that's exactly how it works. And it's not bad. Solemn affirmations concerning its truthfulness are made throughout the volume. But they are intended to deceive if it's a book contrived to deceive. Con contrived to deceive the very ones to whom such affirmations were made. Of necessity, we would be forced to concede. Now here's what they haven't thought about that if the New Testament's a lie, we don't know anything about Jesus. Even the atheist who wants to say we know something about he doesn't know anything about Jesus. Because what has he done to the very book that tells us about Jesus? He said you can't depend on it. It's a book of contrived lies. So how does he know anything about Jesus? So how can we trust then a record of liars, frauds, and deceivers? And having asked the previous question, is it logical to draw such a conclusion in view of what the book actually say? If we decide that the New Testament is true, we have a reason for our hope concerning salvation from sin and in our faithfulness to the Lord as taught in the New Testament, eternal salvation in heaven. And this is the case because it tells of the life and the death of Jesus Christ and all things pertaining thereto. How we can receive remission of sins through faith in Christ and what that faith is and how it's formed and why Christ died and shed his blood and everything else to use the words of Peter that pertains to life in godliness and being found faithful in the Lord's church. And of course that takes the whole New Testament to present all of that. Thus we have good reason, solid reason, for our hope concerning the life that now is and the eternal life to come. One reason for my hope is therefore based upon three facts which cannot be successfully denied. I'll repeat them the third time here. Jesus lived on earth as a human being. The evidence is credible and overwhelming for the New Testament as a historical document. And if it's not true, then the New Testament is a carefully contrived lie. I spent over 55 years studying and teaching and preaching in the New Testament. And it makes no logical sense for me personally to conclude that it's a carefully contrived lie. Now you sit there and you study your Bible because it's the Word of God. I'm not asking you to just listen to me as a preacher preaching a sermon, although you should ask why preachers preach sermons anyway if they do it right. What good is it anyway? I'm asking you to think about what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do when you open your Bible? You study it. It's either God's Word or it's not. I'm fully persuaded that the New Testament's built on facts and therefore contains a truthful account of who Jesus is, what He did for mankind, and for all those who love and obey Him, that they have the expectation of eternal life with Him. Therefore, the New Testament stands as a strong reason for the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And, of course, as it would be for all of us who are faithful Christians, it's our prayer that all will give close attention to the facts that bear on this case for the historicity of Christ and the authenticity of the New Testament. And we'll just conclude by saying a reason for Christ and his gospel to be your hope 
as well as my hope. If you're not a Christian, you won't learn how to be one if you don't know your Bible or listen to somebody that does. You're to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what the New Testament says. And the New Testament is the Word of God. As a child of God, if you sin, the second law of pardon is repent of sins. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. That's what the good book teaches. It is the Word of God. And Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. So if you're subject to the Lord's great invitation, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.